Hi guys, welcome to the uh, control of breathing lesson. Uh, this is a lesson for the respiratory system. Let's think a little bit first of all about how um, the two key ways in which the body controls your breathing, how fast you breathe, how deeply you breathe and so on. There's two key ways that you need to know that the body controls your breathing. The first is via neural control. So neural means to do with neurons, uh, it means to do with the nervous system, it means to do with control from the brain and the central nervous system uh, and the autonomous nervous system, how the nervous system controls your breathing. The second um, type of control of breathing uh, is chemical control and we'll come to that in just a moment. So first of all, neural control can be either voluntary or involuntary. That means from a neural point of view, from uh, the brain and the central nervous system and so on, you can actually take control of it consciously. That's what I mean by voluntary. You can consciously take control of your breathing by using your brain to regulate the depth and the frequency of your breathing. But at the same time, it also can be done involuntarily. And in fact, most of the time, your breathing is an involuntary act. It just happens. And your brain does it without you having to uh, think consciously about it. It just happens. Um, that is until you start to think about it like you probably are now. So it can be voluntary or it can be involuntary. And neural control simply means that, the, that your breathing, the rate of breathing, so that's the number of breaths per minute, that's the respiratory rate, and also the depth of breathing or the tidal volume um, is controlled directly by signals from your brain to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. That is where, so those muscles receive a signal from the brain and when that signal arrives, the diaphragm contracts and therefore flattens and the intercostals, the external intercostals contract and therefore lift the rib cage up and out. And that's the first part of the um, of the cycle of the breathing cycle, the respiratory cycle. So we have neural control, and we'll, we'll deal with that in a bit more detail in a moment. But the second kind of control of breathing uh, that you'll need to know about is chemical control. So that is, there are chemical changes that happen in your bloodstream, in particular, when you exercise, um, and your body is constantly monitoring those chemicals and two uh, in particular constantly monitoring those chemicals um, to determine whether or not you need to speed up your breathing or whether it can stay at resting rate. Um, this process is done involuntarily so this stuff just happens um, and it's where breathing is controlled indirectly uh, through responses as I've just said to different chemical changes that happen in the blood. So a bit more depth on neural control. Um, neural means, as we said already, control by neurons. And you'll know that neurons are the way that your body passes information from one part to another part. Usually uh, a signal of some kind, an electrical stimulus is sent from the brain uh, through the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system to wherever it needs to go. Um, and in this case, the brain um, has two different ways that it can control the sending of signals along the neurons. The first, as we've said, is involuntary control. And in, in involuntary control, this is what happens when you're just breathing normally and not thinking about your breathing. Um, your breathing is controlled automatically by what is called the respiratory centre. And that simply means two parts of the brain in the brain stem that you can see on the diagram there, um, the medulla oblongata and the pons, which are part of the brain stem. And they produce the signal that is sent to the respiratory system, sent to the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm to tell them when and how frequently to contract. That's how involuntary control works. It's neural because it's via the nervous system. It begins in the brain. The signal begins in the brain and ends um, at the intercostal muscles and 
the, the diaphragm. So it's, it's um, neural, but it's involuntary because it's the pons and the medulla oblongata, which make up the respiratory center. Just do that on your behalf. You don't have to think about it. But as you know, if you want to, you can hold your breath. You can hyperventilate if you choose to do that. Uh, you can breathe more deeply if you want to. So there is a voluntary control aspect to the neural control of respiration. And that is breathing can be controlled voluntarily. And this is done um, by sending signals from the cerebral cortex, which is another part of the brain uh, where conscious thought happens. You can control your own um, rib cage expansion. Um, you can control your own intercostal muscles and diaphragm deliberately by holding your breath or hyperventilating or whatever it might be. So there are two ways, involuntary and voluntary control of breathing. So that's neural control. The second type of control, as we know, is chemical control. And this happens by um, these little things called chemoreceptors or chemoreceptors uh, and are dotted around the body. And they are basically receiving information about the chemicals in the blood. Um, there's chemoreceptors in the aorta, which is in the top of the heart, in the carotid artery, which you can see on the diagram is deep inside the neck, and also again the medulla oblongata. And they're looking for two things in particular. So they're, they're constantly checking what's going on in the blood and looking for two things in particular. First of all, they're looking for a change in blood carbon dioxide concentration. Um, if you begin to exercise, um, your muscles produce as a byproduct of respiration, they produce carbon dioxide and they have to remove it by putting it into the bloodstream. As soon as that carbon dioxide is put into the bloodstream, obviously the levels of carbon dioxide go up. So blood CO2 concentration is now increased because you've been exercising. So since exercise means carbon dioxide concentration goes up, we need to respond to that by increasing the breathing rate, increasing the respiratory rate. So we breathe faster. And because we breathe faster, we're able to remove that carbon dioxide more quickly. So the first thing that the chemoreceptors are looking for is, car is carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. And the second thing they're keeping an eye on is blood acidity. So the pH levels in the blood, when the pH levels drop, which means to become more acidic, um, the body responds. The body detects it first and then responds. So exercise means that blood lactate begins to build up, um, especially when we're doing anaerobic exercise. So if blood lactate starts to build up, the pH of the blood will fall. That means it becomes more acidic. And to respond to that, our breathing rate then increases. That is because by increasing our breathing rate, we can get more oxygen into the bloodstream and it is oxygen that breaks down lactate and prevents it from um, causing acidity in both the muscle and in the blood. Um, it can actually be recycled into glycogen and used again. So lactate breakdown speeds up when we increase our breathing rate. So chemical control means we, we look out for carbon dioxide and we look out for the acidity of the blood. And if both of those things uh, go up, then we will breathe faster. Our breathing rate will increase uh, and also the depth of breathing will increase to ensure that both of those things don't cause long term problems, that we can cope with an increase in both of those things. So just to finish off. What exactly happens during exercise? So during inhalation, so when we're breathing in, the brain sends signals to increase the frequency of the contractions. Um, and what that does is it increases the respiratory rate. Um, and also, because the frequency of the signal has increased, the diaphragm and the external intercostals will contract more forcefully. Therefore, the diaphragm will flatten further and the ribcage will lift up and out further, creating a larger thoracic cavity, a larger volume within the thoracic cavity. And in doing that, the pressure is going to drop more than it would do normally at rest. 
And since now we've got a greater pressure difference between what's inside the lungs and the atmospheric pressure, that air is now going to flow into the lungs. So during exercise, by having this greater frequency of signaling from the brain, we can create a bigger thoracic cavity, uh, make a bigger difference in pressure between inside and outside. And so the air will flow in faster to try and equalize that pressure. That's what happens during inhalation. But also during exhalation, when we're breathing out, um, this becomes an active process during exercise. So a signal is sent now to the internal intercostal muscles. They're also recruited here. And they are the ones that when they contract, they pull the rib cage back down forcefully. Now you remember at rest that happens because of gravity. But in this case, because we want to speed things up, we haven't got the time to wait for gravity. And also we want um, the rib cage to be pulled down further than gravity would allow. So the internal intercostal muscles pull that rib cage back down, squeezing that thoracic cavity smaller and smaller. Um, and therefore, again, creating a bigger pressure differential between inside the lungs, which is now high pressured and outside the lungs so that we then breathe out. So those responses then mean that because uh, we're exercising, because we have an increase in carbon dioxide levels in the blood, increase in lactate in the blood, the brain sends a signal to the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm to contract more forcefully. All of that together means that we have a greater minute ventilation during exercise. That is just simply the volume of air that we're consuming per minute increases enormously. And this explains why. Thanks for watching.